Hi, and welcome to the Invigor Medical Podcast, where we're going to walk with you on your journey toward optimal health, performance, and well being. My name is Natalie. And I'm Derek. And we're going to be your hosts on this journey. In each episode, we share insights from top professionals in physical, mental, and emotional health. With that said, let's dive into today's podcast. Okay, today we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Tom Walters, who is a renowned physical therapist and strength conditioning specialist. Um, Welcome to our podcast today, Tom. Uh, With Tom, he has extensive experience in orthopedics and movement disorders, and he's here to share invaluable insights into injury prevention and to discuss his book, Rehab Science, How to Overcome Pain and Heal from Injury. We're so excited to have you. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me on, you guys. Always excited to talk about pain and injury. It's so cool what you guys are doing with this podcast and just helping educate people out there on these topics. So thank you. Oh gosh, that means so much. I'm mostly on here because I love hearing myself talk, but I know that Derek <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> loves sharing, <laughs> loves sharing the good word. I, I'm, I'm very excited. Yes, I'm very excited. <laughs> very excited. We actually, uh, this is awesome. You're the first guest and author we've had that actually sent ahead a copy of the book, which is super fun. We've always like done some research on our own, but it was awesome mm-hmm. to have a physical copy of the book. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see how monstrous this thing is, which is super exciting. I mean, when I flipped through it, it felt to me a bit like an encyclopedia on mm-hmm. taking care of your body yeah. Yeah. And, and helping with uh, healing and injuries. And I know I'm really excited for this because I think a lot of our listeners are people who are in exercise and who want to be healthy and live long, healthy lives. Um, and uh, for a lot of people injury is just so debilitating and feels like it's the end and like what are you going to do I know I um, sprained my ankle two three summers ago first kind of like real injury I've had in my life which is crazy because I was 36 at the time Um, with yeah I know wild right I've been I played soccer growing up you know uh, through high school and I started wearing stilettos when I was 13 so you'd think (laughs) you would think you had good training right you'd think that like I would have had some kind of ankle injury I played basketball too so there's lots of pivoting and power but no it wasn't until I was 36 year old doing something stupid that I totally like I remember the doctor was like this would have healed faster if you'd broken it and I'm like Mm. that's great uh, but it was debilitating, right? Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't go to PT, and I, and I wish I'd had access to something like this because the recovery it did take time, and there was a lot of exercises that I wanted to do that I couldn't do because it's in my ankle, and even now it's like not quite the same size as the other one, mm-hmm. though I don't have pain in it. So anyway, really excited to dive into all of this information, but let's start a little bit with just you. It's kind of nice to get a picture of how you got here and why you wrote this book in the first place. So go. Yeah. All right. Um, well, you know, I, like you, I grew up as an athlete, so I, I was in martial arts uh, and gymnastics. Those were kind of my sports in high school. Oh, wow. And I ended up having knee surgery, I think when I was a sophomore in high school and you know, it was back in the day where we would immobilize people for a lot longer. So Oof. I was in this straight knee brace for six weeks. I just atrophied and yeah. ended up developing a contracture in my knee joint. I couldn't bend it past 90 degrees. And so Yikes. all that, I ended up being sent to physical therapy. And it was my first exposure to this field. Prior to that, I was just obsessed with exercise for performance reasons. You know, I was, mm-hmm. I was like a teenage boy. So I was reading muscle and fitness. I was trying oh, to right. figure out how to make my muscles bigger. Derek's like, <laughs> can relate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's like my first experience with, oh, you can use exercise to, um, you know, rehabilitate yourself like this. I just never had had really an injury and, yeah. um, or had pain at that point. You just heal so well when you're that age. Right. So oh, the good I kind of, I was just, I was already interested in exercise. So I went and did an exercise science degree. That was my undergraduate degree. And then I looked at a lot of different things, but ultimately came back to physical therapy for a lot of reasons. It was just. I wasn't going to be in school until I was out of my 20s, like mm-hmm. medical school. I just wanted to get out and have a life. Like I knew that wasn't going to be the sole focus um, of my life. I wanted to experience my 20s. I was interested in exercise and injury and physical therapy was just a good fit on a lot of levels. And you can go different directions in physical therapy. So I was always interested in orthopedics, which is it's just more mechanical. Like you're okay. thinking about joints, their architecture how joints move. It was more exercise related. Like it was more, it was more similar to the exercises I used as an athlete, and like loved, going to the yeah. gym it yeah. fit with it. You know, it's like, it's more sports medicine. It's like it's orthopedic totally, physical yeah. therapy. It's very similar to sports medicine and you can go into pediatrics, neurological care, geriatric. There's all these specialties with NPT, but I just kind of knew orthopedics and sports medicine was the direction I was going to go. And so 
I went out and started doing that, and I've been a PT for 17 years. It's taken a lot of t twists and turns. I get bored really quickly, so um, <laughs> I'm just a very impulsive person, which I'm trying to get better at not being so impulsive. But I can I just, totally relate we can, to that. We can I just relate. I need yeah. a lot of stimulation. I can't. Yes. I was never. I lasted in a normal PT job for two years, and then I quit, and just yeah. knew that I had to. I don't, um, I think like a lot of us, like there's a lot of these conversations nowadays on people want freedom mm -hmm. and being an employee for someone is not ideal. So mm -hmm. I just knew that kind of the entrepreneurial direction, I didn't really know that at the time, but I just knew I had to do something different. And so I got into teaching, which was, I taught for 10 years at a college here. And that was mm -hmm. a lot better because, you know, like the academic schedule is way looser. Our pro sure. Professors have like, you can go, there's just a lot of free time during the day. Yeah. So that was awesome. And then. While I was at that job teaching, I started an Instagram account. Um, I just was frustrated with things patients would come in and tell me, um, just things that were harmful to them. And unfortunately, a lot of times the other practitioners would tell them to kind of keep them dependent on care. Mm, I've yeah. heard that before too. Oh, it's so frustrating. And it happens in every profession. Some are worse than others, but... Um, that I started posting that was kind of that was December of 2016 on Instagram and I think at the time I was probably only there were only a handful of physical therapists on Instagram posting mm -hmm. physical therapy content and I just kept doing that and uh the social media stuff grew so much I didn't have any idea I had no strategy I was just posting right. on yeah. Instagram. you're just posting just, and sharing well yeah. and, and yeah, just sharing, sharing like content. authentically just yeah. sharing content about questions pe patients had like just trying to be helpful and mm -hmm. it just grew and um, kind of ended up where I'm at now with these uh, big social media accounts and a business that revolves around it and a book. And yeah. it's been an amazing journey, but I would have never thought this is what I'd be doing. Well, that's amazing. You know, to, to touch on the book. Uh, so like Natalie said, this is the first time we've actually received anything. Mm -hmm. and I can't tell you when, when it landed on my desk, I was so excited. <laughs> like I'm, I was so excited and I read the intro and like, um, it resonated with me on a very deep level. Having worked in a physical therapy clinic mm -hmm. as an aide, I, I saw a lot of the similar things that you were just talking about, how like there would be times where like, n not not necessarily intentionally, but where the system itself is kind of built to like, you only have 30 minutes with a patient, 20 of that, mm -hmm maybe even 25 of minutes of that is like spent with an aide, with an untrained person. Cause like I was spending more time with the patients than the physical therapist was. Yeah. And I would see what the physical therapist would do. And like, you know, it's like, okay, well, great. Here's a couple of exercises and then sent them on their way. And so when I read, when I read this, the intro of your book, I'm just like, this is a guy who understands that equipping the patient with the tools that they need to take care of themselves is paramount. Like that is the most important thing, and like I absolutely love that. I don't know if you can if you can touch a little bit more about your philosophy of of uh, giving these tools to 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 patients. Yeah, well, it's you know I think physical therapy when you look at it, there are there's so many problems, and this is when people have a bad experience in physical therapy nowadays. I think a lot of it is driven driven by insurance and reimbursement. You know, when people go in. Mm physical therapists are getting a lot of the same training. There's different approaches and things, but every physical therapist would like to spend more time with people and give better quality care. And I think, unfortunately, that's just not possible. The business, this is why working for someone sucks in a lot of mm -hmm. cases, because they are, of course, it's the business. They're focused on productivity and getting more, being able to bill more units. Um, mm -hmm. And as insurance companies re reimburse less and less, that means you've got to see more patients. Each PT has to see more patients in the day, which usually means that they're spending less time with the physical therapist and then going immediately to the aid. Mm -hmm. And I just think, yeah. you know, when you look at my, my training, I, I had done a residency in manual therapy. So I did a lot of hands-on work with people. And I think there's a lot of good evidence out there in the short term for manual therapy. That'd be like you go in and somebody does massage on you or mm -hmm. an adjustment or mobilizes your joints. But the thing that has the really long term evidence for keeping you better is movement and exercise. Mm -hmm. And so much of that stuff, if you're self motivated and you have a good guide, you don't need someone to sit there and babysit you doing that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can literally just have a book with pictures. Um, and if you're, finding the program then symptom finding some the program that when you look at the condition it matches your symptoms if you know if you if you have that right information you can do a pretty good job of figuring out okay does this sound like i have a maybe i have a rotator cuff problem maybe i've got frozen shoulder you can read that you can read about because people do this all the time right they're going on webmd yeah. and they're reading about what they what their symptoms and trying to figure out what they have and so the book is essentially the next step of, okay, well, you figured out what you have. Here's the program that an exercise that you'd be prescribed in physical therapy. If you're motivated, just go do that just yourself. Do yeah. 
Yeah. You know, uh, before seeing your book, that's something that I kind of like thought of myself. And like, if I if I was ever get injured, I know that there's a series of exercises that are specifically tailored to like these these specific injuries. And so I'd know like go onto Google and search, okay, uh, uh, neck injury uh, physical therapy exercises. And there'd probably be something from some university that would pop up with diagrams. And but like, it wasn't always a guarantee, and it wasn't always. Uh, it wasn't always a university that this resource came from. It would come from all kinds of different places that you, that I wasn't able to personally verify. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. this is this is a good vetted source of information for me to do this. And so that's that's what I absolutely love about about your book. And I don't know, maybe we can actually just like open this up and show people <laughs> like the fact that it's like you know I I love the way you structure it of like okay, uh, you do it by by category of like their you know body part and then let's talk about the specific conditions that these body parts can actually be affected and then you know talking about specifically like okay if this is the body part that's being affected these are the exercises you want to like Mm -hmm. just the the whole layout is just absolutely brilliant like i i I just want to tell you that personally i only see him this animated when he's talking about huberman i just want you to know (laughs) well if i can be anywhere in the same realm that's pretty amazing um well it's it's exactly like you said i think you know I've been a PT for 17 years and after enough time of humans coming in with pain and injuries, you can really, most humans get kind of the same 15 to 20 problems. Yeah. You know, the book covers 50. I, there were some in there that, you know, are maybe a little less common, but it's like, these are the 50 most common conditions I've seen in my years as a PT. And the ones that, and the nice thing is that most of those are responsive to kind of a graded exercise and movement plan. So it really is just trying to give people those tools so that they can. And, and we say a lot in the book, you know, obviously if you don't get better or you've got something, you've had a really traumatic injury or you have some other kind of red flag type symptoms, then you want to go see like someone, a local provider and mm-hmm. make sure there's not something more sinister going on. But most things can be managed on your own. And at the end of the day, even when somebody comes into in-person physical therapy, the goal is to equip them with those tools and empower them and build their self-efficacy so they can learn to manage on their own. It's just like if you want to see a psychologist, you wouldn't want to go to a psychologist that's like, you'll only get better when you come back to see me mm-hmm. each visit. Yeah. And I do these interventions with you. Like Their right. goal is to teach you, give you tools to cope on your own. And that's really what the best evidence-based physical therapy should revolve around. In the book, you know, I, I agree with you. It's, it can be hard to know, are you finding a source out there that's credible? Mm-hmm. And I think what I really tried to do in the book, there's almost 500 research citations, was this, obviously a component of this is my clinical experience, but right. a big part of it is what's in the research. Yeah. So it's not just me making stuff up. Mm-hmm. I think it's really interesting, and I wonder if you can touch on this, you know, looking through the book, I notice, and I'm guessing it's important, that the very first thing you start with is pain. Mm-hmm. How yeah, pain works. Intentional. And why, yeah, yeah. So unpack that for us. Why, when you're like going through like, this is how you fix everything, why is the pain where you started? Yeah, pain, it's the number one symptom people seek care for, you mm-hmm. know, so I think a lot of people have questions around pain, but most people don't understand how pain works, mm-hmm. you know, so there's a lot of misconceptions about, around pain. Most people think that pain always means they have an injury, so people are always hunting for what can I identify in my body that's causing this pain? Can I get an MRI or get an x-ray and figure out what's going on here? And we just know pain is so much more complex, and I think there's a lot of factors that go into pain that... A, a lot of people who come into the clinic, especially when you start getting into chronic pain states, they sure. have other factors that aren't just purely musculoskeletal, whether it's mental health factors, stress, mm-hmm. lack of sleep. This is going to sound like Huberman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nutrition <laughs> factors, like all these other things that play into the pain experience. So I think it's so important from the beginning. I know so many people who get this book just jump to the rehab programs, so but mm-hmm. my hope is that they'll always that they'll go back to the beginning and understand those first five chapters on what is pain, how does the pain system work, what are the factors that influence pain, and then after that comes injury, and kind of just helping people figure out what is the difference between a tissue injury and this experience of pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's kind of what I'm thinking is like, why is it important in the rehabilitation process to understand Mm -hmm. what is pain and how is it operating in the body? And I probably didn't even answer that very well, but it like <laughs> no. it's kind of gives you a roadmap. I think it okay. helps you navigate it because pain creates a lot of fear for people, and sure. there's a lot of that talk in the research. If something is really painful, 
most people, their natural response is to be kind of fearful and anxious about it and then to move less. Mm -hmm. And so then they, and then, you know, sometimes there is a place for contemporary rest, but sometimes that if it lasts too long, that can lead to all kinds of other More issues, issues deconditioning, stiffness in the region, weakness, you know, loss of muscle mass. And so I think for me being in this field, I always feel sort of grateful that having this background in pain, I think I don't get as scared of it when I have it. And so mm -hmm. that was a, that was kind of a big part of those chapters was trying to provide that pain education to people so that they feel kind of better equipped if they do, because we're all inevitably going to have some pain or injury sure. at some point, most likely in our lives. So just feeling like, you know, you don't freak out mm -hmm. if that does happen. Well, is it, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, pain in the body is is meant to like, it's your body's way of, of like protection, right? Like yep. when you put your hand close to fire, you feel pain because your brain's like, that could melt our hand off. That's not totally. safe, right? And so the pain comes as like protection. Is that yep. the way it's also happening in injuries in our body? It's like a noticing something's off. And so it's like pain, be careful. Let's protect this area. Yep, totally. Yeah. Yep. It's, um, yeah, pain, you know, if you look at the definition of it, it's a both an emotional and a sensory experience. And mm -hmm. they say it's associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And mm -hmm. so actual tissue damage makes sense. Like you sprain your ankle, mm -hmm. most people are going to have pain with that. Like you stretch those ligaments, your ankle, maybe you tear them. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to create pain. Um, the interesting thing about pain is that you can also have it when there's potential tissue damage. So there's lots of cool studies where they just make people believe something's going to hurt and they'll experience pain <laughs> even though nothing's being done. So, right. but yeah, at the end of the day, it's a survival mechanism. It's meant yeah. like you need pain. It's soup. We, we kind of think of pain negatively, but there are people who are born without the ability to feel pain and they usually die really young. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have fracture something or have a cut and it gets infected and you can't feel pain, well, that that's bad. Probably. Yeah, it's bad. So, yeah. You know, pain is really a normal thing. What's abnormal is when pain lasts too long. Mm -hmm. You know, so pain, we see these situations where pain lasts longer after the point of the tissue healing. And so you can get in, sometimes people develop these chronic or persistent pain states where their pain system's sort of off. It's like a, it's a, it's like your nervous system becomes too sensitive, almost like if the alarms in your car went off just when the wind blew or something. So does, so, that, so does that tie to like the, the sympathetic nervous system just being too tightly wired <clears> and just like <throat> firing off all the time? Yeah, that's a big, uh, a big part of it. There's a lot of focus now, actually, that's why you hear a lot about dre uh, breathing with pain mm -hmm. is trying mm -hmm. to kind of get some parasympathetic, trying to kind of wind, um, switch from that sympathetic fight or flight nervous system into kind of a relax and digest yeah. kind of state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that is a, for a lot of people, and that's where it's so multifactorial. I mean, that is one part of it. Some people have a lot of sympathetic activity, kind of that fight or flight, and mm -hmm. they're so like tense and just mm -hmm. on edge all the time. And that can feed into basically your nervous system. It's like you're telling your nervous system you're threatened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You time. know, and so it, pain is all about threat. So you're really with people who've had people who have, especially the chronic pain states, you're trying to convince their nervous system that there's not as much threat as it thinks yeah. there is. And then that will kind of reduce sensitivity over time. And that yeah. makes sense why, like, when you've been in pain, like, you're exhausted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I was just talking with a client on the phone the other day, and she'd let me know that she'd broken her ankle. And she sounded so tired. And it, yeah. that makes sense. Like, it's like, if you just injured yourself, and you're feeling that, like, nervousness around movement, and, like, pain could come at any time, plus the pain itself, like, it makes sense what you just said about the sympathetic nervous system just being, like, in high alert. And, like, that's exhausting. You're not meant to live really? that well, way. And I think, I think yeah. it goes the other direction, too. When you're exhausted, I feel like you're more prone mm. to feel pain as well. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. I, I got to tell this dumb joke because it's in my head and I just got to tell it. <laughs> yeah. I went to the doctor the other day and he asked me, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, where's your pain at? And I said, oh, pi, you know, 3.14. And he's like, oh, why is that? And I'm like, because it's low level, but it's never ending. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> what a nerdy joke. Sorry. I just had to no, get that No, never there. apologize. <laughs> I love nerdy dad jokes. They're the best. <laughs> so uh, with that being said, uh, with, so so uh, pain and exhaustion and just like this, all these chronic conditions, mm -hmm. um, what, what's your general approach for, for addressing uh, the kind of the root of all those? Um, I mean, it's so individual to each person. And this is where, you know, this is where it can get a little tricky. This is why the information up front of, so like the programs in the book is so important because people really have to take time to kind of sit and be aware of their situation and try to kind of peel back these layers and figure out what factors what seems to be going on in my life 
that's associated with when my symptoms are activated. Mm. You know, so when I have a pain flare up, what was going on in life at that time? You know, I mean, because again, most people are just going to think if my back started hurting, they're going to think, well, did I like pick something up? What did I do with my back? It's going to be very mechanical in their mind. That's Mm -hmm. just where most people go with pain in their physical body. But when pain's been around longer, you've really got to, you really have to, on an individual basis, try to be aware of all of these different factors, whether it's stress, you know, was I, was there something stressful that happened at work? Maybe I don't, maybe it's a relationship with my boss. Maybe it's a relationship with my partner. Maybe I didn't sleep as well. Inflammation's talked a lot about uh, with pain that persists. And so mm-hmm. maybe there's something from that standpoint of um, it, maybe it's a nutrition type factor. That's there's some sort of pro inflammatory thing that you need to be paying attention to in your diet. That's there. Maybe there's some pattern happening there. Um, sometimes it's just a lack of movement. Uh, you know, there's all these specific kind of therapeutic exercises that are prescribed in physical therapy. And those tend to be more useful with people that have the more mechanical pains where the pain kind of fits with a recent injury or something, Mm -hmm. you know, like an ankle sprain is a really great example. Like there's going to be these really specific therapeutic exercises for stability, motor control, you know, strength that are specific to the ankle Mm -hmm. and maybe up the kinetic chain. But if you have chronic pain, a lot of the research is just focused on more on just general movement, just like getting people to go for walks, like just Pilates, yoga, like whatever, mm-hmm. just find something you yeah. enjoy and just move more. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just looking at some interesting studies the other day where they found that people who were more sedentary, they had more inflammatory cytokines in their blood, which are these immune system molecules. So more inflammatory ones and less uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines. And people who are more active have the exact opposite. So they have less uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and more anti-inflammatory. So why is that? Is it, is it because, because like, I know that when you exercise, like there's an inflammation response. And so is it Mm -hmm. just that your body's better at like taking care of those cytokines and saying like, okay, yeah, this is just, you know, this is just like everyday procedure. Like we just sweep these out. Whereas people that don't move is like their body's not used to that. And so the cytokines just kind of hang out more and and, uh, That's a great question. I haven't really heard a physiological reason for why that is, but mm-hmm. I would imagine it probably does have a lot to do with what you're talking about, just like the vascularity, yeah. mm-hmm. just like blood moving. Because aerobic exercise is the one that's talked about most with chronic pain as being so powerful. And some of it's um, this kind of neurogenesis idea of just like when you exercise, when, with aerobic exercise, you get more blood to certain regions of your brain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that can, we know pain's an output of the brain, so there's some thought that maybe increased blood flow to the brain helps change the pain experience. But I also think just in the body, there's so much reason, you know, if you increase blood flow, you increase oxygen and nutrient delivery to those tissues. So I think there's probably a lot going on. And I would imagine with the immune system, it probably is related some to just kind of clearing some of those inflammatory cytokines and, Mm. and then maybe the exercise itself itself, then you release more of the anti-inflammatory, but I, you know, I don't know the exact physiology of that, what happens. But it's just so cool, just like, you know, like how much we know and how much we don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just wild to me. And you were, you basically just were going to, it just answered the question I was going to ask, like how much of a role does like immobil- immobility play in yeah. pain and injuries, right? But you kind of just said that a little bit, like if it's like mm-hmm. chronic pain, like get out and move, but maybe you want to dive into that a little bit more. What kind of role do you see immobility playing in, in the patients that you see? Can I tack on mm-hmm. that? Just uh, no. a, 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 go yeah. ahead. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just kind of with that. So mo- with mobility. There's also yeah. like you look on like Instagram and all these social media platforms, people that have specific mobility practices. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people do it like as a pre-workout mm-hmm. or they just have it as an independent practice. Maybe mm-hmm. we can kind of lump that in. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that's not sure. too much. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. I love it because there's somebody I follow on Instagram and she has all she's got all these mobility flows. Yeah. She's a mm-hmm. lifter, but most yeah. of what she posts are these beautiful mobility flows. Which is I really just cool. watch they look cool, but I'm also like her body, her physical intelligence mm-hmm. and the way she's mm-hmm. moving is just so tight. And it's I'm yeah. like, I yeah. wanna be like kind that. of her motor control and awareness. Yeah, it's fun it's to incredible. watch people who are really good movers. Yeah. It's yeah, and like I can't art. help but think it's... she's gonna be ninety five. And moving like that. Like, that's yeah. what it looks like when you look at her. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, mobility is an interesting one. It's become such a popular, there's so many people kind of creating programs and mm-hmm. things related to mobility. And I mean, mobility in the physical therapy kind of rehab space is just one of the kind of components where somebody could have impairments. So, 
like in physical therapy, somebody comes in and we're look, we're doing assessments looking for impairments in their musculoskeletal system. So mobility is one of those, you know, basically how far can your joints move? Can they move through their full range of motion? Mm -hmm. Whereas flexibility is usually looking at how the extensibility of your muscle tendon units. So like mm -hmm. think about like a sit and reach hamstring test, like we all had to do as kids, like mm -hmm. that's a hamstring flexibility. You're looking at how far can a muscle stretch? Mm -hmm. Um, so in those other impairments like balance, coordination, motor control, strength is an impairment, you know, so you're kind of going through and looking at where are the deficits in this person's system and mobility has just become really popular. I think because on visual apps, visual platforms, it's easy to see. Mm. Sure. So, but it's really important. And I think there's a lot of people doing good things. There's kind of different branches of it. There's passive mobility, which would be kind of more like a passive stretch where you're... Well, you just got balloons. You just got balloons. What is that? What happened? Okay. So there's been some kind of update, not to get off topic. If you're not watching on YouTube, balloons <laughs> just went over Tom's screen. <laughs> I had this happen when I was on a, a Teams call the other day and they're like, can you hear me? And I was like, yep. And then like a thumbs up bubble went and I was like, yes. what? And then I started trying and I, I went hearts and hearts came up oh, and I did Pete. Like, and we spent 10 minutes of the meeting just seeing what all we could do. So what um, triggered balloons? I have, I didn't even know that was a thing. Congratulations. No Mobility. Try to do it again. Mobility gets balloons. So <laughs> um, that, I was just going to try and ignore it because I was like, I have no idea There were so many right balloons. Right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that is awesome. That's um, Yeah. So no, I think in the mobility space, yeah, there's like passive mobility, which is kind of like it's like they're like joint stretches it'd be like mm -hmm. if you we do these a lot in people who have like uh, joint contractures or stiffness like, like it, where, you, where you do like a chest stretch you put your arms in the door and you like yeah that would probably be more like and that would fall it, this is where things get like you get into semantics like that gotcha. would probably be more of a flexibility thing because okay. it's a muscle stretch sure like a joint mobility one would be like uh, one we do a lot is like ankle dorsiflexion like say somebody mm -hmm. has a limited ankle dorsiflexion like they can't um push their kind of go knees down. over toes like the knees over okay. toes mm. position they can't mm -hmm. do that with their ankle this happens a lot after ankle sprains they lose ankle joint dorsiflexion mm -hmm. so it's kind of like you're putting someone in a position where there's no muscle stretch or very little mm -hmm. and it's putting all the force into their joint tissues so okay. um what's another good one oh say like um another one that happens like with knee surgery sometimes people lose the ability to straighten their knee all the way okay and so just straightening your knee joint there's a little bit of a stretch on your hamstrings but it's mostly in those people that their joint tissues get tight mm. You know, so that would be like passive mobility. We do a lot of those things early on in rehab. But a lot of things you see on Instagram are more like active mobility. So the person, they're kind of cool because they require coordination and strength and good mobility. And ultimately, mm -hmm. that's what you want. That's what would happen towards the end of the rehab process is you want somebody to have good control over their body and have the strength to move against gravity through full range mm -hmm. of motion. Mm -hmm. So like a pistol squat is a good yeah. example. You know, like pistol squats, like... So hard. Pistol squats, you have to have so really hard. good joint yeah. mobility for one mm -hmm. in your hip, knee, and ankle. <clears throat> and you have to get strength and motor control to be able to actually go down and successfully get through full range of motion and back up. Not a lot of people can do a no. good pistol, pistol squat. I can't. Oh, I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> Not even no, close. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my goals. I'd love to be yeah. able to get there. But yeah. it's a, a, when you don't really, you're like, oh, yeah, let me try that. And then you like start, you're like, nope. Well, like, yeah. there's I'm, just so much happening there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Uh, Natalie, your your Instagram handle is that tall girl. That's true. How how tall are you? I'm six foot. So so I'm six foot three. So yeah. like maybe it's just Height. like there's just so much farther to go there's down. Those are man. long levers. Yeah. It is. It's true. I mean, biomechanically, those are longer levers. I'm only five nine, so I think, you know, being a gymnast and martial arts, there is something to be said for that. Look at all the Olympic gymnasts. They're short levers. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it is harder. I think as you get taller and you have long femur, long tibia. Mm -hmm. Like you just have a lot. Your muscles are moving way longer yeah. levers to mm -hmm. do something like that. All right, cool. I'm glad we have an excuse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, still, it's like you don't really like even just lifting up the non-standing leg and flexing your your quad to try to get it straight and hold yeah. that while simultaneously engaging everything else and keeping your balance. And it's wild how much. Yeah. I mean, I want to be able to do yeah. it because like it'd be cool, cool yeah. to say yeah. you can do it. <laughs> but there's so much going on there. You're totally yeah. right. Hey, I hope you're enjoying today's podcast. I just wanted to take a quick break because if you're listening, you probably know what we do here at Invigor Medical Podcast, but maybe not what we do at InvigorMedical.com. So let me introduce us. At Invigor, we provide prescription strength treatments and peptides for weight loss, sexual health, and lifestyle optimization. Every treatment plan is carefully prescribed by licensed doctors and sourced from legitimate pharmacies. You don't ever need to buy questionable research chemicals again. 
And bonus, as a podcast listener, you get a 10% discount on your first treatment plan with code PODCAST10 at InvigorMedical.com. Now, let's get back to today's episode. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's it's a complicated. Yeah. You look at those movements, and they, people who are good at them make them look so simple. And then when you mm-hmm. go to do it, you're right. It's like if you your nervous system will tell you, right, like, nope, this isn't happening. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's almost like that first time you go for a box jump. Hey, you're yeah. like, oh it's boy, 24 inches. Like this is, mm-hmm. but like you just have to really talk yourself into it because <laughs> yeah. your brain's like, danger, danger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And then one day you prove exactly. yourself right that it is dangerous you, like, when you finally ball. knock when you go. Oh. And then you see Dr. Tom yeah. Walters. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Keep me in business. That's right. Get a book. Buy the book. That's right. That's right. So, so talking about about mobility practices, it's it's kind of just like a good practice. Like, I, I guess what I'm trying to see is like, is it overhyped? Is it too much? Mm-hmm. Or is it something that actually does have a lot of good, solid good uh, 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 basis behind it? Yeah, I think sometimes it gets a little overhyped, like foam rolling was sure. for a while. You know, like, it's not like you need to go. I think what you want to do, it's good to warm up. Yeah. And especially as you get older. Like, I didn't warm up at all when I was in my teens and 20s. I'd just go sprint and do mm-hmm. weight lift. And, mm-hmm. But I think now that I'm 42, like, I have to, if I don't warm up, I tend to tweak things easier, mm. more easily. So I think when you think about mobility, I think the easiest thing for people to think about is whatever movements you're planning to do in your workout, have a warm up that kind of takes you through those movements mm-hmm. at a lower intensity. Yeah. yeah. Like, don't make it overcomplicated. Like. Right. You don't need to spend 20 minutes like foam rolling every muscle in your body. Or if you're going to do squats, you probably don't need to do a bunch of shoulder mobility right. exercises. You just need to do the, you need to go, you might just do squats, but yeah. just body weight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, just brilliant. Don't make it overcomplicated. Brilliant. Very cool. I guess uh, part of the reason I ask that is one of the people that I follow in the space, Peter Atia, you know, he's, uh-huh. he's very uh, outspoken about a lot of things. But one of the things he's very outspoken about is, what he calls stability training, which I don't, Mm -hmm. I think it's beyond mobility. And I think is because his whole focus is like longevity and, and Mm -hmm. health span and increasing that as much as possible. And so I think the type of exercises he does are much more practical and much more Mm -hmm. kind of like activity of daily living on a kind of on steroids, more or less. Mm -hmm. Uh, What, what is your take on things like along those lines? Yeah, no, I see a lot of the stuff he posts. Um, I appreciate that he's very uh, like a proponent of kind of the musculoskeletal system mm-hmm. and strength because we do have a lot of evidence on that related to longevity, things like grip strength and yeah. quad strength and those being predictors of how long you live. And I, uh, I think that the whole kind of usually stability exercises are ones where you're using your neuromuscular system to really improve the control of kind of your joints and your kinetic chain. So yeah. It could be something like, um, like sometimes we'll do ones where we do like a lateral step down. We'll have somebody stand yeah, on a step those are and they the have to worst. reach down. Yeah, those right? are the worst. <laughs> yeah, personally, I, like, I had a knee injury in in uh-huh. middle school, and yep. those are the worst. <laughs> yeah, totally. They're like they're, um, you know, there's exercises like that where they're of course going to build strength, but more of the focus on them. They're just with body weight. They're more trying to help co- kind of build that brain body connection. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that neuromuscular control because your muscles are innervated by nerves that Mm -hmm. come from your spinal cord, which are connected to the motor cortex in your brain. So when you try to move and learn to control something, you're sending a message, an output from the motor cortex of your brain. It descends down your spinal cord and then it goes out the motor neurons to the relevant muscles. Yeah. And the more you practice that, the more refined it becomes, just like learning to shoot a basketball or something like you're just you're you're developing a motor program. And so a lot of stability training is that like an ankle sprain is another good example because ankle sprains because you're damaging ligaments the primary impairment is a loss of stability in the joint Mm -hmm. so if you damage a ligament which is a tissue you don't have voluntary control over it's a passive tissue it's ligaments we don't have nerves that connect them you can't contract your acl like it's just in there it holds it together so if you tear a ligament like with an ankle sprain, then you're going to focus primarily on teaching your neuromuscular system to make up for that loss of stability because of the damaged ligament. So you'll use your peroneal muscles and your tibialis posterior and your tibialis anterior and your calf muscles. You'll perform exercises where you're kind of you're improving the efficiency of your nervous system to control that joint to make up for the loss of stability due to the ligament damage. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So when Peter, like, I think when these people are talking about, I agree when you're looking at longevity, you want to have strength yep, for, sure. for sure. Like you need to have strength because we lose muscle mass. Oh, there's See, the, thumbs the thumbs up. up. I told um, you. <laughs> you need to have strength because we lose muscle mass as we age. This is the whole sarcopenia thing. Mm-hmm. But I think before, like, if you think of it like a pyramid, 
strength to me comes kind of after movement quality. Like you should learn how to move well first, mm. which is like where, you know, me growing up martial arts, I took it for granted when I was a kid. I just learned to move well. And you know, I was always barefoot yeah. and I was always standing on one leg doing things. So, mm. you know, I think there's a lot of value in just first learning to how to control your body, become aware of your body and control it through movement with just body weight. And then after that, putting load on it and getting stronger. Mm. That is ties in perfectly because my next question was going to be how how important is the strength and conditioning regimen uh, when contributing to injury prevention and overall health which i was going to caveat with also so many people that lift or do intense exercise regimens cause injury through it and i feel like you just kind of like reverse engineered that a little Touch bit right on that well, right and one thing i'm interested in is the pyramid like so, so we're, mm-hmm. we're talking about just overall good movement at the bottom strength training's probably somewhere above that i'd be interested to see what the other levels are if i don't know if that's a thought that you've like solidified <laughs> um, yeah yeah it's not one i've like fully built out but it's um it's it would be interesting to put that kind of structure all those things because and i think it depends on what your goal is For sure. um at the end of the day, if you are thinking about something like longevity and kind of health span, um, I think when it comes to the musculoskeletal system, if your concern is longevity and health span, the thing you want to avoid are injuries. Right. Yeah. Right. Big so time. like, cause if you have a musculoskeletal injury that leads to some major impairments and that limits you from participating in things in life, and then maybe that ultimately takes you down the road of being more sedentary and less active that's what's going to take you towards death basically and the quality faster. of life to just it, like precipitously drop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Like, you know, I mean, one of the tests that you hear about all the time is basically just, can you get up and down from the ground mm-hmm. without touching the ground? Right. Yeah. Without touching with your hands. We're going to and... be doing that after this, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, a test like that is a really good indicator. Like they've done that and they scored on an 11 point scale and every point you lose, they've followed people. The people who lost more and more points died sooner. Yeah. Wow. So, it's not like not being able to get up and down from the ground causes you to die. It's just that it's associated with a lack of strength mm-hmm. and mobility. And I, I think it, you know, maybe a pyramid's not a great way of thinking about it because I wouldn't necessarily say it's like you've got mobility kind of components, you've got motor control, and you've got strength. Mm-hmm. And you kind of maybe a circle or like well, a pie chart's like better. Cardiovascular aspects of that as well. Cardiovascular, that cardiovascular health, side. You know, yeah. So there's, yeah, it's a very complicated totally. web for the sure. VO2 max, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I think if you're looking at just the musculoskeletal system, it might be better to have kind of like a pie chart or something. I would almost think kind of active mobility, motor control, and strength all kind of share equal portions of that. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about getting up and down from the ground, you need need good hip and knee and ankle mobility. You need the strength, kind of like that pistol squat to get up and down. You may not be able to do that first, but if you do some strengthening exercises to get yourself to the point that you can, right? Yes, exactly. And strength training... If you look at uh, injury prevention, resistance training has the best evidence. Yeah. So every physical therapy rehab program, all the phase three, phase three of every program in my book is resistance training, Yeah. You know, which has a motor control aspect to it. You have to learn to control your body through those movements. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, you want to be able to pro- – it's that idea of progressive overload. Like as you put stress on your musculoskeletal system – the tissues become more resilient and become stronger. And if your tissues are more resilient, they're less likely to fail mechanically. Right. Yeah. You know, like if your Achilles tendon, for example, like well, that's a worry for a lot of people is I don't want to rupture my Achilles tendon. Well, if your calf muscles and your Achilles tendon are stronger through doing calf raises and jump rope and different things, you're less likely to tear that tissue because it just, it's just stronger mechanically. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So I'm curious, cause we also talk a lot about food and the impact it has Mm -hmm. on overall health. Mm -hmm. So are there foods that contribute to um, healing after injury or that might be a roadblock to injury? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think nutrition is a huge uh, factor to consider. I mean, those are the building blocks of your tissue. So I think after injury, um, probably one of the most important things to think about is uh, protein intake. Mm. And, you know, we hear a lot about this on in nutrition talks, uh, right now, um, uh, Peter Atia, like different podcasts out there, but you'll hear if you're involved in strength training or healing, the number you hear a lot is one gram per pound of body weight mm-hmm. for protein. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a good kind of easy one to remember. Sometimes you hear 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram. I've heard but- take your body weight, multiply it by 0.7. 
Uh-huh. And I've heard yeah. that too. So another like anywhere one. from 0. 0.7 to like one gram per pound of body weight. Mm. Another mm. one I heard is take your height, convert it to centimeters, and then that's <laughs> fairly good. <laughs> There's so yeah. I, I don't love know. all the different it's, things, right? Yeah, people are, people I, are but coming I'm like, up with all a lot kinds of protein, of stuff. right? Especially yeah. if you're lifting. That's like my yeah. focus of my nutrition is like not necessarily keto or paleo or whatever. I'm high like most protein. of what I'm getting is high quality protein. Everything else is yep. a bonus. Totally. It's so important for healing those tissues. And I think that if you focus on your protein first, you're less likely to f- eat a bunch of junk stuff mm-hmm. that, you know, you're just getting all these empty calories from everything. Yeah. That's, you know, it's that's satiating bad. that mm-hmm. much protein yeah, in a meal. Exactly. You, try, you try to eat 45 grams of chicken yeah. breast or beef and that's like, you don't have a lot of room left no. or anything no. else. Yeah. You'll tap out. You're not going <laughs> to keep uh yeah, that's part of the problem that you hear with uh Western diet is this, that everything tastes so good. You could actually be full, but when there's all these sweet and mm-hmm. salty things, you can keep eating them. Yeah. That's a whole tangent, but I think, yeah, uh, yeah, for injury, I think protein's really big. Some orthopedic surgeons will actually even prescribe protein drinks after surgery for people just to make sure they're getting enough, you know, obviously getting enough calories because if you're hypocaloric and not getting enough, it's going to be hard to rebuild tissue. Well, Uh, Uh, and then I think, you know, when you start, do you guys know the site examine.com? Oh, I love it. I've been, I've, I've been getting ads. In fact, they just ran a recent ad that's like. $500 $500 for a lifetime membership. Oh, yes. I'm like, $500 is a lot, but it's like for the entire <laughs> life. Whole, like, oh like, my gosh. Yeah. It's so, an investment. Yeah. I'm on the precipice. Mm. But yeah, anyways. I'm not Exam so is explain. awesome. I've been using it for probably 10 years. What um, is it? And uh, they, it's a website that is uh, run. It's all evidence-based nutrition. So they look at every supplement and every health condition. So you can search by health condition or by supplement. Mm-hmm. And it will give you a breakdown of the evidence, how strong is the evidence for whatever thing you're looking at. Really? And it's all non-biased. It's just literally teams Third of party. PhD researchers. Yeah. Phenomenal. It's amazing. That's cool. And it, and, how have I never yeah. heard of this? And the user interface is so just like clean and amazing. <laughs> and our podcast so, has become an advertisement well, for Examine.com. Well, here's the thing. Guess who, guess who else uses Examine? <laughs> oh, dear Lord. Mr. Huberman. And there Dr. Is. Huberman. Yeah, so he, yeah. he talks hey, about it Hey, but this time I mentioned Huberman first again. You did. You That's did. two episodes in you a row. Did. We have a running thing. Like how long will it take Derek to mention yeah. Huberman? But I did it first you last it time first. and again, but in reference to you use and yeah. reference to your love, but it still counts. Mm-hmm. It still counts. No, it's a good site. I think that because there are a lot of, I mean, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to pain, um, you could kind of go different. If your focus is mostly pain, then I think you, and especially chronic pain, then you might look at ways to reduce inflammation in your body. And then sure. you hear things like curcumin, turmeric, mm-hmm. things like, like there are some out there, fish oil, mm-hmm. things that can help reduce inflammation. But I think to me, those are, you would only think about those after getting everything else dialed yeah. in with your Very mental health, your stress, your sleep, your movement. Yeah. Um, and then on the injury side, if you've had surgery or you've had an injury where there's an actual tissue injury, um, then you would really first, from a nutrition standpoint, be thinking about protein and calories. I gotcha. Mm-hmm. And inversely, do you see uh, more injuries in patients who ha- have not good diets? Like, that are consistent. I mean, I- I'm just curious if that plays a role too. If you like consistently have mm-hmm. a bad diet, you're not getting good nutrients, are you more prone to injury in general? Yeah, I definitely think it's hard to track, mm-hmm. but I think the where the area you hear about this a lot is um, people who are extremely hypocaloric with like eating disorders mm-hmm. and just thinking about stress fractures and just the body breaking down because of that. Yeah. Um, it, it's hard to know, you know, it's hard to get patients. I don't think people are always aware and are they going to be honest, honest right? about yeah. When I think about It'd be sugar, really interesting to track. I think about sugar too. Like you've mentioned inflammation yeah. multiple times and sugar mm-hmm. is like the biggest proponent of inflammation exactly. in the body, right? And then yep. if you don't know how your uh, gut microbiome is working or if it's imbalanced or if you have sensitivities yeah. to food, like just, you know, it could be gluten is causing inflammation in your body totally. or other things. And so it may make you more prone to injury because of what's going on. Or with make the, food. the injuries yeah. more prone to pain, you know, things mm-hmm. along yes. those lines. That's the thing too, like because a lot of the a lot of people who have chronic pain will have started with kind of a normal acute injury, yeah. mm. you know, but then it turns into something. I have one actually in my back that I've had for six years. I have kind of a spot that's about the size of my a quarter, mm. kind of in my right, like mid, lower thoracic spine mm-hmm. that started in jujitsu. It was a rib injury in jujitsu, and then I was in a stressful job. I was in that teaching job, yeah. and just there were certain stresses associated with it. My kids were young. There's just a lot of life stress and. I think that I, there's all these, there's this saying you'll hear a lot that nerves that fire together wire together. Mm. And so it's, this is true for mental health disorders too, like panic attacks and things that 
you get kind of a pattern of neurons that fire together. And the more you keep firing them, the easier it is to fire those. Yeah. Yeah. And chronic pain is like that too, where your nervous system gets better at firing that pattern. So it takes a weaker and weaker stimulus to fire that pain pattern or that panic attack or whatever that it makes is. And so much sense. Unless you do something you have to, to counteract kind of to that. De- yeah. So it's like, it's a lot of it is graded exposure where you don't run from it. You kind of try to face it in small baby steps mm-hmm. and get your system to desensitize. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had to kind of do this, my back it's not. And I think this is a good thing for people to know that if you have a pain thing that's been around for a long time, it's not always realistic that it will completely 100% go away. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just more about management. You just figure out strategies to kind of keep it at bay so you can keep doing the things you like to Mm do. And maybe you have to modify some things in life, but some pains don't, it's not realistic that they totally go away. If that were the case, we'd have a solution for chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And chronic pain is only getting worse and worse. Mm So I think um, you have to look at all these different factors and just know going into it that you probably can help knock it down, but it might not ever fully go away. And that's how the case for my spot. I have this spot that starts hurting mostly from psychological stress, even if it's good. Like even if I'm about to go on vacation the night before, mm, it'll start hurting. So, really with that. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's not even like mechanical anymore. It's something else in my... Yeah, okay, so now that we're talking about chronic pain, this is not on here at all. And it's something that just popped into my mind because it's something that I've been learning a lot about the last couple, last year or so. And I'm curious your thoughts on CBD, the endocannabinoid mm. system, as it relates to pain. Because I know I've read so much research about people with chronic pain who mm-hmm. eat on a really good, high quality CBD supplement um, to like have it nearly eradicated, mm-hmm. you know. And so I'm curious, have you done any of learned that kind of learning on your own and how it applies? I ha- I need to go dig back into that research a little more because there's so much out it's there. And I, I and when crazy. I was writing the book that we do have a whole chapter on um, complementary and alternative medicine kind of practices. Mm-hmm. And I know with like, I have seen research uh, supporting, um, you know, THC and um, strategies that target that system for things like um, chronic pain, chronic cancer, cancer pain. It's mm-hmm. so, like you hear this in cancer, you hear this in certain pains. Mm-hmm. I need to go back and look. CBD is tricky because the CBD kind of creams. I think there just needs to be more research on it. When Mm -hmm. I looked the last time, there weren't a lot of good. You need these um, sham studies where you have a fake cream Mm -hmm. versus the actual CBD cream. Because what ends up happening in a lot of those studies, a lot of the things we think really are have high efficacy and really work when they do it against a sham a lot of times it's no different. Right. So it, it's, it's just, it points to like how powerful people's beliefs are. Mm-hmm. Not to say that CBD may totally have a mechanism that's totally. there. I just, I haven't dug into that research recently and I haven't seen it shared. Yeah, I would say dig into study. it again because it, there's been a lot more in recent yeah. years uh, that's coming out. And even aside from creams, just internally daily doses of CBD mm-hmm. and CBD being one comp, one cannabinoid of thousands yeah. they're discovering totally. within the hemp plant, like literally thousands. And they're starting to figure out what each of these do. I mean, the most commonly known ones are THC and CBD, obviously, mm-hmm. but those are just two cannabinoids. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, uh, it's wild. Huberman, uh, talking about Huberman yeah, again. Here he we just go. Had, um, <laughs> yeah, he had Dr. Sean Mackey on, yep. uh, who's the, I think he's the director of the pain medicine Medicine Center at Stanford. Yeah. Um, and that was a great podcast. And he really dug into a lot of those pathways. Mm-hmm. And I think he did talk about some of that stuff in there. And I need to go back and look at it because the number of CBD companies that reach out to me mm. oh, yeah. <laughs> about it, and I usually just kind of blow it off. Mm-hmm. And I'm so focused on movement and exercise sure. and education around pain. But I think if you get all those things dialed in, I'm totally open to people adding those. To me, they're Agreed. complimentary things. Yeah. Like It's like sauna and cold therapy cold and <laughs> right. like all this other stuff you can do it's like that wouldn't be your primary intervention i don't think but it would be like a complimentary thing that, that can really help. if there's something a prp and stem cell are like that yeah. too like if you want to add those in one, and just see if they help one thing that i wanted to actually ask yeah. a question about that you talk about in all these alternative therapies that you talk about specifically is peptides right um mm. so so peptides um it's it's a very interesting field to be in right so at a vigor medical we we offer prescriptions for peptides mm-hmm. that you know and you know there's a lot of really popular peptides nowadays like semaglutide yeah. uh you know mm-hmm. wigovio zempic those are both peptides you know insulin is a peptide that's used for treatment and it's been used for treatment of diabetes for you know yeah. decades now um and so you know there there are some cases for peptides but one of the things that w- that you talked about in your book is you have to be really careful where you source these peptides mm-hmm. from because they can be 
like just like really bad yeah. you know yeah. um, i don't know if you want to touch on that just a little bit yeah, I do. I mean, I think that's one of those areas. Uh, just we didn't go into extreme depth on that topic. Obviously, I'm not an expert in. It. I think there's just you. Ne- there needs to be a lot more research done on it. Mm-hmm. But I just think that's one of those areas where there really could be, there could be some things that come out of that that really change the way we think about the treatment of pain. And but I think people just have to go into it knowing that it's kind of in the early stages of research and development. And I think, you know, the protocols with these different things, where the source you're getting it from, you just have to be, I just think you have to be pretty skeptical and um, really do your homework mm-hmm. going into something like that. Sure. I mean, that's true for a lot of these other interventions that we talk about a lot, PRP and stem cell are like that. It's you can find studies that support it and you can find studies that don't support it. And I think it's just most of the people I talk to in these areas just basically say there isn't enough research where the protocols for how it's developed have been and studied enough to determine this is exactly like the formula that we should use for this thing. And I think, so maybe they work, maybe they don't. Um, but I think the first place it sounds like talking to people who are in those spaces is that we have to figure out what the formula is that has the highest efficacy first. And go from there, you know, and, and, yeah. and to touch on that as well. So the part of the reason I bring this up is you go and you look up peptide sources online and yeah. like there are literally people who are purchasing peptides from websites from that, and they, that are called research chemicals and on them say, do not inject this into your body. It is a research chemical and they are and buying then, it and say like, I've seen Facebook threads that are just like make me speechless where it's just like my subject is doing X, Y, and Z. And it's like, they're referring to themselves injecting this Mm. research chemical into their bodies. And it's just like absolutely mind blowing to me. That's pretty freaky. When it's like there, there are, you know, it is an expanding field. And so people just don't know where to look, Mm -hmm. but there are Mm -hmm. places like in vigor medical where like you can get a legitimate prescription. You can actually Uh like talk to a doctor and say, okay, yeah, this can do, these are approved for these uses. And like, actually walk you through the process so yeah what do you guys prescribe it for is it for uh pain and injury is it uh, lots of different so so uh, we don't actually prescribe for pain and injury but i mean the what are Mm. the peptides we carry we carry quite a few so pt one for one is actually name brand vilisi but it's uh bramalanotide it's for postmenopausal women that have a lower libido Mm. so it's something that Mm. increases libido we have some morlin which uh, helps uh, it's a secretagogue which induces um, natural production of HGH in the body um, and you know the, obviously HGH is illegal um, but there's a host of benefits that came from that and so there, there there's a lot of different peptides and then mm. uh, semaglutide is a GLP-1 uh, mm. uh, glucagon like peptide that helps people yeah. lose weight so you know there, yeah. there's a lot of peptides that do have a lot of evidence behind them and then there's other ones that that don't have as much and so you know you have mm-hmm. ones like bpc 157 that the mm-hmm. fda has actually come out against and said like hey mm-hmm. d- don't carry this mm-hmm. and then yeah. you see these places that are like selling it and are like having it front and center and it's just yeah it's absolutely crazy yeah that chapter you know actually that chapter in the book um I think when we do future additions, it's the one that will change the most Mm -hmm. because it's all these alternative kind of interventions and a lot of them are newer. And I just think there's going to be so much more evidence. A lot of the pain and injury stuff around education on pain and um, exercise and movement and sleep, a lot of these things are more established. I think that chapter, every time we do a new addition is where I'm going to have to spend most of the time. It's where I it's really probably where the most surprises came as I was going through the research, just because things are changing there all the time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Even listening to you talk about peptides, I'm like, wow, I need to go learn more yeah, about peptides. Yeah, right. And CBD. <laughs> Add CBD and peptides to the list. <laughs> yeah, totally. There you go. Oh my gosh, we could go on and on. We could. Clearly. We'll have to have you back on the podcast. This has mm-hmm. been such a fun conversation and so illuminating, and I feel really confident that our listeners are going to latch on to all of the content here there was just so much to learn and definitely recommend picking up if you're physically active at all or you let me get it in the camera frame uh or you have injury or you just want to know how to take better care of your body and to heal and overcome pain and injury uh this is like it feels like the encyclopedia and yeah. there's just so much incredible information here and by the way thank you for writing this book because lots of people don't have access to pts or they live in pain and in fear and like going and figuring it out is actually something that 
they resist because they're afraid it's going to be bad news. And I believe that knowledge is power. And you writing this book is an incredible step in people taking control over their own health and well-being. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. And where can people find you in your book? Well, thank you for saying all that. Thank you for having me on. So much of the mission with the book and all the social media stuff was to because you're right, there are so many people out there who can't afford care, don't mm -hmm. have access. Even if you leave it in an area with good care, sometimes there's right now eight week to 12 week waits yeah, and there's just so much time. people can do yeah. on their own. So yeah, I mean, if people are looking for more of this type of content, I'm just Rehab Science on YouTube and Instagram and the book is called Rehab Science, How to Overcome Pain and Heal from Injury. So it's pretty much Rehab Science everywhere. If people, <laughs> I try to respond to comments on YouTube and DMs on Instagram. So if people have questions, they listen to this and they're looking for a link for something, they can always DM me. So. We're just so excited that you took the time to be with us today. Uh, really excited for our listeners to gobble up this content. Anything you want to add here, Derek? No, I mean, obviously, I was gushing at the beginning and gushing <laughs> at the end. You know, you, I, I'm, I'm absolutely a huge fan of the work that you've done, and I, I'm thank you. very honored that you joined us and I had the opportunity to, that we had the opportunity yeah. to talk with you. So yeah. thank you so much well, for joining thank us. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for letting me come on and talk about this and about the book. I really am so passionate about helping people understand pain and injury. There's so much we can do to navigate these things on our own. And um, so I just, thanks for the opportunity to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Invigor Medical Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can support us by liking and subscribing. Your feedback matters, so feel free to share questions or future episode ideas in the comments section. For more information about our prescription strength treatments for weight loss, ED, and overall wellness, all from qualified doctors and reputable pharmacies, visit us at invigormedical.com. And don't forget to use code PODCAST10 for a 10% discount on your first treatment plan. Until, Until next time, stay well. well.